So now I'm going to ask to the to, to ask the panelists to join us uh, to the stage to debate about ethical leadership in critical time in time of uncertainties. Ms. Safak Pavey. She is senior advisor to the UN Nation High Commissioner for Refugees. Please. <laughs> Mr. Laurent Chong. He's founder and CEO of Consulus from Singapore, author of Creative Change. Please, Mr. Chong. Mr. Ignacio Packer, executive director of the Co-Initiative of Change Foundation. Mr. Packer. Ah, okay. Please, and Mr. Obiora Ike. Chairman of the Enugu State Government Economic Advisory Committee from Nigeria. Good, and perhaps a chair for me. I will, I will stay there. <laughs> Leadership. Uh, I, I need a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. So, ethical leadership in a critical time. To be honest, we can't say that uh, ethical leadership is always present in the current way world of politics, business, or relationships between nations. First question I'm going to ask to, to each panelist, what is an ethical leadership? Laurence Young, you are, you're well known in your country as a leader in innovation, in strategy. Could you explain your vision of uh, ethical leadership. What is for you? Can you explain? Take your microphone. <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you for having me, and it's a great joy to be here. Um, I think I think in short, ethical uh, leadership is about this sense of responsibility to the common good. How much do you care? How much does it matter to you that the world does better today and tomorrow? If you don't have uh, that sense of care, if you don't have that responsibility, you will never be ethical. And the challenge with unethical leadership is because the people who do that believe that the world can afford their failures, can afford their, how they expand uh, the global trust that we have built up over many decades. And you and Fadi mentioned that we are coming to the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Convention. And I often think um, that after the Second World War, how much the global leaders of those days felt that it is critical to define a new world order on the basis of the common good. And they did so not simply as victors, but they did so because they felt a great sense of care and responsibility for the common good. So I think we have a great deficit of leaders who don't care. And we have a great number of leaders who feel that they can continue to afford leadership failures because they think that you know, um, the, the issue of the day uh, doesn't require them to be so uh, responsible. So I think that uh, in some is, is my view. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chung, your advice is um, very precious. You are followed by 400,000 professionals follower on LinkedIn. Uh, you're uh, from Singapore. It's a very competitive uh, world, we can say. How can you manage to be uh, to have a, an ethical um, attitude in, in such a competitive uh, world? Well, our founding leaders of Singapore, um, they understood that ethical leadership is a decision. And they were the youngest politicians of the time. They were graduates uh, of the British Empire. 
uh, they believed in autonomy and independence, but they had a great position and um, committed vision that ethical leadership is required to rebuild Singapore society. Now, I'll give you an example. In Chinese culture, giving gifts to politicians is quite a, a practice. And when the founding... Not only in China. No, not only in China. <laughs> but when the founding leaders of Singapore decided no politician will receive a gift, uh, it's quite a thing to tell Asian politicians not to do so. And, when, and, and that's because they felt that there's a higher order of care you need to have for society, and they made it so. The other thing is, when the British Empire used to rule us, they were kind of a divide and conquer type of power because they are a small country, and in order to manage bigger countries, better to divide and conquer and don't let people mingle. And again, the founding leaders of Singapore, because they decided that being ethical is by choice and decision, um, they put communities together, Malays, Chinese, Eurasians, all together, including the right of religious worship, according to the diversity of identity and religion. Right? So again, it's not so much about they have to be ethical, but they made a decision to be ethical by choice and by design. And also because there's a higher order of care. And that's how Singapore benefited from that level of leadership, by care and for the common good. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Savak Pave, your um, senior advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Refugee from Istanbul. Um, Lauren Chung is uh, works uh, in the private sector. You you work in international organization. Uh, what is ethical leadership uh, on a multilateral level for you, in your opinion? Thank you for first of all for Globe Ethics to invite us here with my esteemed also panelists here. Um, it's it's a pleasure to give this kind of reflective space. Uh, to us to speak about something different than just our work, but also on the philosophy level, cultural level, psychological level. I would like to start I forget with... to say that you, you're very famous as a human rights activist to a pacifist, journalist, a lot of titles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, please. Um, but, um, but also I'm very proud of having quitted Twitter, having had 1.4 million uh, followers uh, who nevertheless uh, still follow. <laughs> so that that is like a gift of uh, sometimes taking the right path. Um, but um, so it, it is actually I would like to bring the conversation from the cultural level, which you have spoken to and a state system that has actually aimed to transform the culture. Um, I would like to bring us to a psychological level as well, uh, because one really wonders uh, when we are visiting this question of ethical leadership. Where does our personality, how does our personalities shape that we become unethical or ethical? Uh, there is an impressive study when I was preparing for this, I actually came across uh, an impressive study done by Zurich uh, University of Psychiatry and um, General uh, Psychology departments over the years. It was concluded in 2013, done over, I mean, the, the case studies were actually um, over 350,000 adults um, to, to understand and come to the conclusion that the character traits do not change after the age of 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gives us actually a very big clue uh, that family life, family values, on top of it, the sociocultural um, environment and the geography we education, have education, education, and then and then education until a certain point, thirteen. They say very conclusively in that study, which is in the open um, open environment of uh, Zurich University, where everyone can reach. Very interesting study, and it actually summarizes what William James, an American philosopher, used to say that when you reach thirty. Uh, one's character is like so, so much of a plaster uh, that it would never take any other shape again. Mm. So it actually just reinforces also a proverb in my culture, which is Turkish saying, 
um, is that um, the, the character doesn't come out unless you die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it just reinforces one another. Therefore, it brings us actually, well, they worked around five main character traits, uh, which included, um, uh, which is very interesting because it brings us actually all the um, character traits that we are looking at, ethical leadership in adulthood, um, you know, role modeling and everything else. But they actually looked at um, how through the criteria of openness, empathy, um, and uh, honesty, um, agreeableness, um, being transparent, all these things. And then they actually carry, carry on as they were shaped by the age of 13. Therefore, I actually would like to very much whether uh, we want to leave it in the hands of our families or geographies, or we want to top it up uh, by early education uh, modules. I think that would be the one, one solution that can be, bring us in a more ideal space. Mm -hmm. now, when you are looking the, the the world today, uh, the state of the world is rather discouraging. No? <laughs> Very do, you much. See, do you see some hope uh, today? <laughs> Uh, or uh, I, I do hope you, <laughs> you see, or you're, you think it's uh, we, we are to. in a time of regression, uh, regression. Yes, we have to. In the humanitarian space, if there is no hope left, then you cannot survive in that space. Mm. In, in either case, we have so many our great partners here. Uh, they know how difficult because we, we live the consequences. I mean, we live meaning that uh, those that we are serving as well um, live the consequences of, of terrible um, uh, decisions that are being, being taken bilaterally, sometimes multilaterally, um, which is polarizing the world further. So yes, um, I should, I mean, that's what we say for a commoner. I mean, I've been a parliamentarian, so I, mm -hmm. I, I also mm -hmm. <laughs> define myself as a commoner, as a mm -hmm. member of the commons, <laughs> House of Commons. So, um, but I always, um, think that as a commoner, that's, that's our bread, right? Hope is our bread. So we need to continue in hoping, but how to build bridges and restore some of the hope in the multilateral system is that moving away from this minilateralism mm -hmm. and moving away to a more solidarity space, um, sticking to the principles and ethical values. And there, I would really say what I am doing under the High Commissioner right now is the multi-stakeholder partnership approach that we are promoting and, and bringing everyone at the table, every voice that includes faith-based uh, uh, actors and uh, religious leadership as a as to provide also some moral compass. Yes, I explained some psychological, you know, I entered into the ethics from a psychological point of view. Psychology is for the last century has been the discovery and one of the most popular sciences. But this used to be done, the healing of the soul used mm -hmm. to be done for centuries by the clergy. Mm -hmm. So that was their job. Yes. Um, but now it can work together, I believe. Uh, we need to bring Retail. that ancient knowledge and philosophies into the table as well. Ines Opaker, you represent here the, the co-foundation based in Switzerland, no? in co. <laughs> the aim of the foundation is to build trust across the world's divide, to build, to build a peaceful and sustainable world uh, where people act in spirit of responsibility. Um, it sounds uh, a little bit too topic, no? Or... <laughs> <laughs> your your definition of ethical leadership. You have to live with <laughs> with big ambitions, and I'll come back to that yeah, in a, sure. in, in a <laughs> sure. moment. I think you have to stand stand for values, and get out of the way when you have to get out of the way. That's my definition definition of an ethical leader. When oh, Martin Chokong just left, but when he talked about twenty seven percent of women on parliament, it's also because men are not. Step, uh, stepping down. When we look at uh, organizations that are led by men, but keep on saying how important it is that uh, we be more balanced, if more men would step down from their positions, that would help too. At CORE, we do a lot around storytelling and around ethical leadership, for instance, because it's important for leaders to tell their stories of how they have led in an ethical way, just listening to the Prime Minister of New Zealand when she said her tank was empty 
I think that's just extremely inspiring. And I think it's very encouraging also for people who are finding the way of being an ethical leader. An ethical leader aligns its values to its deeds. So wherever, whenever, has to stick to its values. And when Fadi, when you say that the, 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 uh, the pact, uh, the UN pact for the, for the future is, is going to New York with hardly any or no mention of ethics and of values, that is of course something that is absolutely incredible and can question how come ethical leaders have led for a document to be in that in that state. This is the, the, the moral element that we are missing at the moment in the state of the world we're in. And it's for each one of us, each individually, for us to stand up for, for this. Ignacio Paco, uh, perhaps tell us what concrete initiative uh, are you taking with the Co Foundation to promote uh, this, this world of uh, values, of peace, of uh, yeah. what kind of uh, action? I think the, the specificity of the organization is to be a movement. Mm -hmm. And where the focus is on how and the responsibility of each and every individual. We have a, a place above Montreux. Perhaps you've been yeah. there. Yes. We, we've, <laughs> we've never met, and you haven't been introduced, but it, I've never met you, but you have come so often to my <laughs> living room. But I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you because you were previous at uh, uh, Terre des Hommes, no? That's, That's right. right. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so in... In core, for instance, is just to take an, an example. It's a center for dialogue where we don't organize ordinary conferences there. There are forums where people enter as who they are, whether they are um, head of state, we even had a Royal Highness last year, ambassadors or farmers from the Canton de Vaud. And it is how we get inspired on the different levels how each and everyone has to take a different commitment around aligning the, the values. And I think that is one of the, the key elements which is, which is brought by a, a very different type of organization that is uh, the co-foundation. Uh, co Laurence Chung, do you know the co-foundation? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Obi Obiara Aik, you're a scholar, writer, a lot of things teacher, professor, uh, very involved in the society of your country, uh, Nigeria, to promote a better society. And you're going to give us the, the, the point of view of Africa, uh, who, the, the continent that has so much to, to contribute to the world. Tell us about your concrete action, perhaps, uh, with your Catholic Institute of Development, Justice and Peace. Thank you very, very much. First of all, my greetings and appreciation to the entire audience. I think it's a great conversation we are having around ethical leadership. Um, before I just answer that question, many people occupy positions which they should not occupy. There is a distinction between authority and position or even power. Some people are given power, but they don't have authority. So what I find confusing is the use of the word leadership when actually they should be followers and not leaders. So we have a world where not everybody can be a politician first position or be the leader of either a church or whatever it is. And all of a sudden one buys it, leads the others and they have to follow. And you are blind leading people who have eyes to see. So this is the dichotomy and the antinomy we have that leadership especially ethical leadership is being piloted by people who don't have even the integrity to lead others as a point of start. Now, the next thing is to address your question, which I thank you very much for. A continent like Africa is very wealthy and rich in human resources, in natural resources, in wisdoms that are beyond time and space. And you find a continent being led by people who should not actually be their leaders. So that voices have now to come from those who feel called, who have the vocation, who have a passion, who have a desire 
to change, to add value, to do something. Because each person is gifted. What we do at the Catholic Institute is to try to empower people, give them the voice which they normally have, but they have been prevented from having it, to even develop themselves and be that which they wish they could be. And it's been very, very successful in areas of health, education, um, sponsorships, cultural activity, um, skills, empowerment, and the, the, being the voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through education. Lauren Chiang, uh, time is running very fast. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, Lauren Chiang, perhaps uh, I, I told that your advice is very precious. What kind of advice would you like to, to share today with uh, our audience in, in this uh, issue of uh, ethical leadership to improve all over the world? Yeah, I think the unique lens um, my colleagues and I have in 23 countries you know, around the world is the problem of spotlight leadership. And what I mean is increasingly because leaders are under so much scrutiny, they have a decision paralysis. They no longer want to make decisions. They want to make statements. And you have a conundrum there when leaders are not trusted to make the right decisions because they're so afraid to do so. So that's one crisis that we see whether we are serving governments, multinationals, uh, decision para uh, paralysis, right? Because of spotlight leadership. The second uh, issue is that the, our current environment actually favors unethical leadership than ethical leadership. There is no loss to be unethical. Uh, that's why you have the invasion of Ukraine and that's why you have uh, the crisis is whether you're talking about economics, we talk about um, AI, we, we are dealing with a very real situation in the capital markets where because of artificial intelligence, we will have more than two thirds of capital in the power of artificial intelligence determining the faith of more than 160 nations in the world. And there's no loss. Mm -hmm. No one will be fine, regulated, it's totally legitimate. So when unethical leadership is fueled and supported, and you have decision paralysis, you have a perfect power cake of what we call an explosive uh, world order. Because uh, leaders who are brave enough, they are it's... few. Uh, you know, in interreligious dialogue, um, we call this what we call an impasse of dialogue, when you are not able to cross over to the other side to understand which is why it is very interesting that even in interreligious dialogue, Pope Francis wrote this document with the Grand Imam of Al Azhar to consider, because both religions have fought for centuries, mm -hmm. to consider that both religions can come together to cross over to the other side and say their vision for a shared humanity. We don't have that conversation in the capital markets. We don't have that conversation uh, even among politicians, right? Mm -hmm. So you have decision paralysis because of spotlight leadership. And then you have uh, uh, the cost. There's, there's no cost to be unethical. So yeah. I think those two are, are very dangerous uh, situations, at, at least from, from our observation around the world. Mm -hmm. Safak, um, you're, I, I, you told that you were a parliamentarian from uh, Istanbul, huh? former par mm -hmm. parliamentarian. You, you, you were honored in 2012 with the International Women of Courage Award huh, by the United States Department of, um, of Taste. Uh, in your vision, uh, what is the role of women? Uh, does the woman have a, a special role in this uh, a fight for uh, ethical leadership or in crisis? Uh, well, in every societal challenge that we have, I'm one of those believers uh, very deeply that we have gender equality at the very core of it. The issues that are stemming in our societies, wherever it may be, uh, whatever continent it may be, whatever harm practices, harmful practices there may be or inequality, it actually drops down to for not having our kids, girls, boys, those kids with disabilities, non-disability, uh, those without, are not sharing the same um, school benches equally next to each other. That's the, that's the issue. Um, and uh, the anger, the aggressiveness of cultures um, show surfaces itself 
more on the women and children issues. Um, so yes, I believe that ethical um, for the, for a more ethical world, there needs to be that reflected. That needs cultural transformation. You have mentioned of my parliamentarian hats as well, um, where I try to dedicate time to this. But in my view, and I presented it several times, my dear colleague Michael Weiner uh, can remember from the Human Rights Council sessions sometimes uh, when I was invited. That's my other home, by the way. So uh, don't tell this high commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I was trying to say as well, they're articulated through my parliamentary journeys. I have seen that international norms, international law standards are there, uh, but cultural transformation is not happening when the legislations are being adapted under those norms and standards. It stays like, a, like, a, um, like an accessory in the guest room. Mm -hmm. uh, in the culture that it translates into. So that is where we need a lot of this more intercultural, interfaith um, dialogues and campaigns supporting legislative reforms. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you look at Pakistan, my dear mm -hmm. um, peers there have tried very hard, mm -hmm. uh, very hard to transform, but transformation did not happen. If it is not topped up by a cultural campaign, legislation can stay there as a spaceship. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's my view. It's what so you are trying to do in, in, co in the co-foundation. What your comment on what uh, Safak said, just said? Yes, and I, I, I would compliment saying how it is important to move away from cynicism and to hope hope was mentioned many times, but hope is something active, not something that we, we talk about. And I realized how important that was about 10 years ago when I was in a, in a, in a meeting, a small meeting with uh, scientists who were just describing how we were going against the wall and so on in terms of environment. So that was 10 years ago. Didn't, didn't, didn't need the words of the, uh, of the, of the pact at that, at that time. And the rest of the group were, were religious uh, leaders so holding the, the, the norms, the values. And I, I felt very cynical about that, but I came out from that saying, no, we have to build on around hope and around the inner development of each and every one of us. Systemic change would happen in that way. What are the skills and the qualities that individually we have to develop to be leader, leaders, ethical leaders, not only when we talk in parliament and so on, but an ethical leader perhaps already in, in, in our communities, in our, in our families. And that is something that Geneva has to play a role on. There is something which is called the Inner Development Goal Framework, which is a set of 23 skills and, uh, and qualities. And this for the moment is spoken elsewhere. For instance, I'm invited uh, for the um, summit of the future, the Habada, so which is a, exactly on the same dates, because in New York and last year, we didn't manage to talk much about the inner development. So it is in Qatar that we're going to talk about that, and that mm -hmm. there is a summit go going on uh, there where I'm, I don't know why, but they invited me as, key, as keynote speaker. But it's in Geneva too, that we have to structure. And there are a number of organizations that I think are getting together around, around this, uh, this, uh, this effort to be bringing these, this need to develop these uh, skills and, uh, and qualities in a much more focused way. Without that, the sustainable development goals, we would stay on what was said earlier on, on that technical perspective. Last year in New York, he was saying how we were regressing on the sustainable development goals. 50% of the indicators are off track. 25 are uh, um, um, regressing and 25% are still on, uh, ongoing. Mm -hmm. So something has to happen. It's not only about more commitments, more money and so on. It is something where uh, uh, ethical leadership and this commitment to the, the, the values that that ha were at a high cost after the Second World War. I stop there, sorry, I'm going over time. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Uh, I will let you the, the final word. I, I suppose you're uh, agree with all was that you have a, a strong professional skill in human management, religious thought, leadership, and uh, uh, we just spoke about, I've spoken about the corruption uh, in leadership uh, all over the world in, in your uh, country too, in Africa too. Uh, what can we do to have a 
uh, ethical leadership to, to eliminate corruption, to eliminate uh, special interest? A very good question, and it will continue to remain a question. It's a big question. We have but what, <laughs> I find, what I find very important was even listening to the first speech by Professor Fadi when he spoke about truth. You have a world that denies that there is truth. When you don't have objective, agreeable realities, you subjective everything, and then you start wondering on which road to take. So we must establish and agree, first of all, that there is something globally, universally agreeable, just like we're talking about ethical leadership. I mean, global ethics is bringing us all here together to reflect on how we can be the practice of what we talk about. So teaching by doing, integrity is the word. And when you have it, you know, things like corruption and, and so on, which are very clear issues because of the human condition, the human condition of being created out of earth, dust, breakable. And this breakability of the human being makes the human being prone to weakness. But how do you engage a human being except by encouraging? You see, a shepherd takes care of sheep. And when they go astray, you bring them into the line. The same thing with SHIP, a ship that is driven by a captain. The captain stares through the waters. But you have now families where everybody does what you like and there is no shepherd and there is no, she, um, no driver for the men, for, like a pilot, a plane that is moving without a pilot. The condition of the world is that we are looking for persons with integrity and it has nothing to do with gender not just to say 50% men, 50% women, but they don't have the quality. Some people who have the grace to be who they are, occupying their positions, can help the world be repositioned. It starts with education, it starts in the family, I had it, it starts in places where laws and rules are made which people obey. It starts with agreeing that there are things that the human person is imbued with some rationality, with some qualities. The human being knows what is good, can aspire towards it. And this is what we must be preaching so that ethical leadership, also what we are sharing these days through Globe Ethics, convening us together, becomes that meeting point where we discover that we are all human and we are all persons and we have all rights. And there is nothing different from A, to be, except that we are we are born on the same space and breathe the same air, therefore share the goods of this world. I love the word common good, because that's exactly from moving from person to the community. And that's where Africa has to do its work and bring its ancient wisdoms to support the universe with commonality, sharing things in common, eating together, the family. I mean, these are values that are enduring. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry to interrupt such a, an interesting discussion, but the time is running. <laughs> Professor Dao is looking at me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Safak Pave. Thank you, Obiara Aik. Uh, thank you, Ignaz Obaka. <laughs> so we meet. And uh, thank you, Mr. Lauren Chung. We can continue the discussion after, in a few minutes, for the, during the reception. Thank you very much. And now it's time to meet the, uh, the winners. <laughs> so I will invite. <laughs> Please, an applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>